Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and this video we've got a lot to talk about. So stuff's went a bit crazy in the Game of Thrones fandom, and George R. R. Martin has put out a big blog post detailing all his thoughts on House of the Dragon Season 2. The guy will do anything but write the book, um, it was very controversial, he talked about some spoilers for Season 3, you know, kind of kind of crapped on the creatives, and uh, within a couple of minutes the, the entire post was deleted. Guessing that he got a message from Warner Brothers, and the worst thing is they didn't even warn a brother. The internet is of course forever though, um, so I thought in this video we'd kind of go through what he says, as doing something like this is completely unprecedented. Now full disclaimer, I have an okay relationship with HBO, um, I'm guessing George did as well, but they still copyright claim uh, all my vids, however after a dispute they normally tend to lift it. However, if you're from HBO and there's something in this video that kind of spoils or something massive, then please get in touch, yeah? Don't copyright strike the video, please. I don't really want to give the studio a chance to copyright claim this video, um, so we're not going to be using any of their footage, and basically all this video is going to be is me reading the post out and kind of giving my thoughts on it. Normally I'd have clips for context, um, but that could cause issues copyright-wise, so I'm, I'm not taking that chance, and the editors can have a day off, shabow, best boss in the world. Now the fact is, at the moment, we don't know why it was removed, so all we can do is speculate. Lack of knowledge is basically how all conspiracy theories start, as people kinda guess what might have gone on behind the scenes. In the end though, I have to state we don't know why it was removed, but as we go through it, I'm sure there'll be a couple of things that'll flag up. There's some leaks and spoilers in for season 3, and also this is a guy who works alongside a big studio, um, so they might not want someone coming out and saying, I didn't like the stuff that you're adapting from me. Like I said, it's pretty unprecedented, um, it might even be unprofessional uh, for a creative to do this, especially because they've got so many projects in the work at Warner Brothers. So it might have been deleted because of the tone, how it makes the showrunners look, or even just the fact there's plot spoilers. Now that means that there's also a spoiler alert on this video as well, but obviously if you're reading a George R. R. Martin post, then chances are you've read the book. I do worry that they might remove this video, but it could be a Streisand effect thing, so maybe they won't. Anyway, that's why it won't be as polished as our usual videos. Big long disclaimer out the way. Also, yeah, before I forget, I, I spoke to a lawyer, and they said I have to say season 3 is subject to change as it's being written all the time. We also contacted HBO for comment, um, initially they said that Ryan Condal addressed the comments in a show's podcast which HBO have sent us a transcript for, which is over 17 pages long. I can sum it up, but they've also put out a more professional statement, and I'll go through that at the end of the video. So who? sorry, yeah, we'll just get on with it, and this is what George has said. Back in July, I'll not do the voice, back in July, I promised you some further thoughts about Blood and Cheese and Mail or the Missing. After my commentary on the first two episodes of House of the Dragon Season 2, A Son for a Son and Rhaenyra the Cruel. Those were terrific episodes. Well written, well directed, powerfully acted. A great way to kick off the new season. Fans and critics alike seem to agree. There was only one aspect of the episode that drew significant criticism, the handling of blood and cheese and the death of Prince Jaehaerys. From the commentary I saw online, opinion was split there. The readers of Fire and Blood found the sequence underwhelming. A disappointment watered down from what they were expecting. Viewers who had not read the book had no such problem. Most of them found the sequence a real gut punch, tragic, horrifying, nightmarish, etc. Some reported being reduced to tears. I found myself agreeing with both sides. So you can see things from both sides, um, and I actually put out a video at the time, you know, after Blood and Cheese happened, saying I did feel like the, the whole thing was a disappointment. That's because I'm a big fan of the book, um, and from my perspective, they kind of dropped the ball on stuff. Not to be a complete egomaniac here, but I did wonder when reading this if George actually watched my video, because there was something in there I said that he also seems to repeat. But we'll get into it. In my book, Egon and Helena have three children, not two. The twins, Jaehaerys and Jaehaera, are six years old. They have a younger brother, Melor, who is two. When Blood and Cheese break in on Helena and the kids, they tell her they are debt collectors come to exact revenge for the death of Prince Lucerys, a son for a son. As Helena has two sons, however, they demand that she choose which one should die. She resists and offers her own life instead, but the killers insist it has to be a son. If she does not name one, they will kill all three children. To save the life of the twins, Helena names Melor, but Blood kills the older boy Jaehaerys instead while Cheese tells little Maelor that his mother wanted him dead. Whether the boy is old enough to understand that is not at all certain. 
Also, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be reading out this text. So if you want to just put this on and go for a walk or something or do the dishes or put iron the clothes or something, no hard feelings. I then goes on to say that's not how it happens in the show. There's no male or on House of the Dragon, only the twins. And he then says, both of whom look younger than six, but I am no ju judge of children's ages, so I can't be sure how old they're supposed to be. Blood can't seem to tell the twins apart, so Helena's asked to reveal which one is the boy. You would think a glance up his PJs would reveal that without involving the mother. Well, we'll not get into that, George. Instead of offering her own life to save the kids, Helena offers them a necklace. Blood and cheese are not tempted. Blood saws Prince Jaehaerys' head off. We are spared of the sight of that, as sound effect suffices. In the book, he lops the head off with a sword. It's a bloody, brutal scene, no doubt. How not? An innocent child is being butchered in front of his mother. Now, George then says he still believes the scene in the book is stronger, and the readers have a right of that as well. This is because the two killers are crueler, and though George says he thought the actors who played the killers on the show are excellent, the characters are crueler, harder, and more frightening in the book. In the show, Blood is a gold cloak. In the book, he's a former gold cloak. Stripped of his office for beating a woman to death, Blood is the sort of man who might think making a woman choose which of her sons should die is amusing, especially when they double down on the wanton cruelty by murdering the boy she tries to save. Buck Cheese is worse too. He does not kick a dog, true, but he does not have a dog, and he's the one who tells Maelor that his mum wants him dead. I would also suggest that Helena shows more courage, more strength in the book by offering her own life to save her son. Offering a piece of jewellery is just not the same. I then says, as I saw it, the Sophie's Choice aspect was the strongest part of the sequence. Now that's what I mentioned in my video. Um, I know Sophie's Choice is a whole thing, so he probably didn't watch it. Um, but that's kind of what I gave it an analogy of, as I, I felt that was the most fitting way to describe the scene by using pop culture terms. It does kind of sum up, though, the main criticism of the scene. Um, and he says that, judging from the comments online, most of the fans seem to agree. So yeah, I'm of that notion, but yeah, what's quite interesting is that Ryan Condal actually explained to him back in 2022 why they weren't going to do it. I'm not going to keep reading this stuff out, um, but basically George says that they argued and after much heat they decided to weaken the sequence. This is because Ryan says they had to do it for practical reasons and they didn't want to cast another child, especially a two-year-old toddler. Now this kind of then goes into how production works with children, you know, they can only work a certain amount of hours a day, um, there's also getting them involved, you know, their parents in, uh, flying them out, hotels and so on, um, and it kind of gets into how that would balloon up the budget a bit. But something that Ryan said they didn't necessarily need. George then says the budget was already an issue on House of the Dragon, and that it made sense to save money wherever they could. Moreover, Ryan assured me that we were not losing Prince Maelor, simply postponing him. Queen Helena could still give birth to him in Season 3, presumably after getting with Charles late in Season 2. That made sense to him, so he withdrew his objections and acqu acquiesced this change. Dear me. Now he says he still loves the episode and the blood and cheese sequence overall. Losing Helena's choice did weaken the scene to him, but not to any great degree. He said that only book readers would even notice its absence, which is something I agree with, um, and I did still find the, the, the scene quite a gut punch. Now this is where the tone kind of changes, and George goes on to how the removal of the prince has a big knock-on effect. He says, those of you who hate spoilers should stop reading here. Spoilers will follow, at least for the readers among you. If you've never read Fire and Blood, maybe it does not matter because all I'm going to spoil here are things that happen in the book that may never happen on the series, starting with Maelor himself. Sometime between the initial decision to remove Maelor, a big change was made. The prince's birth was no longer just going to be pushed back to season 3. He was never going to be born at all. The younger son of Aegon and Helena would never appear. Most of you know about the butterfly effect, I assume. It's a great movie. Underrated. Yes, there was a movie with that title a few years back. I knew it. It's a familiar concept in chaos theory as well, but most science fiction fans were first exposed to the idea in Ray Bradbury's classic time travel story, A Sound of Thunder, wherein a time traveler from the present panics and crushes a butterfly while hunting a T-Rex. When he returns to his own time, he discovers that the world has changed in huge and frightening ways. One dead butterfly has rewritten history, the lesson being that change begets change and even small and seemingly insignificant alterations to a timeline or a story can have a profound effect on all that follows. Now he then says that Maelor's a two-year-old toddler in Fire and Blood, but just like the butterfly, he's got a bigger impact in the story. 
The readers among you may recall that when it appears that Rhaenyra and her blacks are about to capture King's Landing, Queen Alison becomes concerned for the safety of Helena's remaining children, and takes a step to save them by smuggling them out of the city. The task is given to two knights of the King's God. So Willis Fell is commanded to deliver Prince Jaehaerys to the Baratheons at Storm's End, while Maelor is given over to Sir Rickard Thorne to be escorted across the Manda to the protection of the High Tower army on its way to King's Landing. Willis Fell delivers Jaehaerys safely to the Baratheons at Storm's End, but Sir Rickard fares less well. He and Maelor get as far as Bitter Bridge, where he's revealed as the King's God and tavern called the Hog's Head. Once discovered, Sir Rickard fights bravely to protect his young charge and brings him to safety but he does not even make it across the bridge before some crossbows bring him down. Prince Maelor is torn from his arms and then sadly ripped to pieces by the mob fighting over the boy and the huge reward that Rhaenyra has offered for his capture and return. Will any of that appear in the show? Maybe, but I don't see how. The butterflies would seem to prohibit it. You could perhaps make Sir Rickard's war be Jahera instead of Maelor, but Jahera can't be killed as she has a huge role to play as Aegon's next heir. Could maybe make Maelor a newborn instead of a two year old, but that would scramble up the timeline, which is a bit of a mess already. F bloody hell, George. He says he's got no idea what Ryan has planned, if anything, um, but given Maelor's absence from season two, the simplest way to proceed would be to just drop him entirely. Lose the bit where Alison tries to send the kids to safety, drop Rickard Thorne, or send him and Willis Fell so Jahera has two gods. Now this is when he kind of spoils what's going to be happening in season three, and he says that from what he knows, Ryan seems to be doing this. It's the simplest yes, and may make sense in terms of budgets and shooting schedules, but simpler is not better. The bitter bridge scene has tension, suspense, action, bloodshed, a bit of heroism, and a lot of tragedy. Rickard Thorne is a tertiary character at best. Most viewers, as opposed to readers, will never know he's gone, since they never knew him at all. But I rather like giving him his brief moment of heroism, a taste of the courage and loyalty of the King's God, regardless of whether they are black or green. The butterflies are not done with this yet, however. In the book, when word of Prince Maelor's death and grisly manner of his passing reaches the Red Keep, that proves to be the thing that drives Queen Helena to, and I'm going to YouTube it, unalive herself. She, dear me, she could barely stand to look at Maelor, knowing that she chooses him to die in the Sophie's Choice scene, and now he's dead in truth. Her words having come true. The grief and guilt are too much for her to bear. Now this is a big... Big uh, spoiler for season 3, so spoiler alert, quit, quit the video if you don't want to know. In Ryan's outline for season 3, Helena still well, unalives herself for no particular reason. There is no fresh horror, no triggering event to overwhelm a fragile young queen. And I must stress from the lawyer, season 3 is still being written as we speak and things are subject to change. And he then goes on to say, and the final butterfly follows soon thereafter. Queen Helena, sweet and gentle soul, is much beloved by the small folk of King's Landing. Rhaenyra was not, so when rumours began to arise that Helena did not unalive herself, but rather was murdered at Rhaenyra's command, the commons are quick to believe them. That night, King's Landing rose in a bloody riot. And he basically then goes into how it's the end of Rhaenyra's rule over the city, which ultimately leads to the storming of the Dragon Pit and the rise of the Shepherd's mob that drives Rhaenyra to flee the city and then return to Dragonstone, which then leads into her death. Spoilers alert there, George. Now this is where he kind of says, Maelor by himself means little, he's a small child, does not have a line of dialogue, does nothing of consequence but die. But where and when and how, that does matter. Losing Maelor weakened the end of the Blood and Cheese sequence, but it also cost us the Bitterbridge scene with all its horror and heroism. It undercut the motivation for Helena's unaliving herself, dear me, and that in turn sent thousands into the streets and alleys, screaming for justice for their murdered queen. None of that is essential, I suppose, but all of it does serve a purpose. It helps to all tie the storylines together, so one thing follows another in a logical and convincing manner. Which I completely agree with. I think, you know, even watching Blood and Cheese, I was thinking like, mail or missing, it's, it's going to mess things up. I think it kind of shows that maybe they didn't focus so much on what was going to happen down the line. And you can kind of see that in some of the character choices. Nettles is a big one as they've kind of smushed that together um, into another character. Uh, but in doing so, you're kind of thinking, how's that going to work down the line? Not to get too spoilery with it, but Damon ends up running off with her. Whereas if they do it in this... Though incest and being inbred like yeast is a big inbred like yeast is a big thing in the show. I don't know if it's gonna work when it's father and daughter. 
So yeah, it just kind of seems like they're more focused on the season, not necessarily what's coming in season three and four. But because of that, you know, pieces are going to fall apart. You're kind of building it with a house of cards where, you know, it's steady at the bottom, but the, the further up you go and basically the, the more the butterfly effect doesn't have repercussions, the more that the impact of these events is going to kind of lose what they're actually going towards in the end. It'd be like if they did Sun for a Sun without killing Lucerus at the end of season one, you know what I mean? George N says, what will we offer the fans instead once we've killed these butterflies? I have no idea. I do not recall that Ryan and I ever discussed this back when they first told me they were pushing back on Egon's second son. Maelor himself is not essential, but if losing him means we also lose Bitterbridge, Helena's unaliving herself and the riots, well that's a considerable loss. And there are larger and more toxic butterflies to come if House of the Dragon goes ahead with some of the changes being contemplated for seasons 3 and 4. So yeah, w what a way to end the, the blog post. You know, obviously he's like, I think this is just throwing shots at me. Like, you need to give me a call, mate, before you sign off on these scripts because uh, some of this stuff ain't gonna work. Now, like I said before, HBO sent us a massive 17-page transcript of the podcast. Um, I'm not gonna read up everything. I've kind of summed up the main points. But basically, um, in regards to Blood and Cheese, Ryan Condal said, the, the children they had in the story were simply too young to be able to construct that narrative exactly as laid out in the book. He also later says that the writing that they did in the show was always available to George um, and there are places that they might not have agreed or, you know, co-signed off on, but he, he's always tried to take on board his notes. So yeah, that's kind of how um, things happen with it. I, I, I do get the kind of technical issues with Blood and Cheese. I just think that, you know, you could have just had that extra kid in because it's not going to cause so many issues down the line. And, you know, maybe doing this little thing in season two it's going to help your story a lot more down the line. But like I've said, they've gone with that choice. And yeah, um, HBO have also reached out for comment. This comes from the streamer. You know, that's who we work with in terms of PR. And they got the comment from them. And here's what they said. There are few greater fans of George R. R. Martin and his book Fire and Blood than the creative team on House of the Dragon, both in production and at HBO. Commonly, when adapting a book for screen with its own format and limitations, the showrunner ultimately is required to make difficult choices about the characters and stories the audience will follow. We believe that Ryan Connell and his team have done an extraordinary job and the millions of fans the series has amassed over the first two seasons will continue to enjoy it. Which, yeah, obviously we're going to have to see, you know, it's a bit difficult to kind of judge this entire thing um, without, you know, seeing it for, for how it turns out. I think with season two, though, um, it has had its issues and a lot of that has come down to the writing and how they've adapted certain parts of the book. I think season two, uh, and I have discussed this a lot before, season two started off really strong. You know, you had the, the Blood and Cheese episode, which I do still like. I just felt it disappointed in terms of the book. And then you had the Cargill Twins stuff. You know, episode three was nice and solid uh, when I think that was one where Rhaenyra went to the, the keep. And then episode four was the Battle of Rook's Rest, which was definitely the high point of the season. Now, after that, you had the Dragon Seeds. Um, I do like Adam of Hull. Uh, I do like, um, you know, Ulf and Hugh, what they did with them. And I thought episode seven, especially, you know, where you've got that big dragon pit scene, it was really, really well put together. My issues kind of lay with how they laid things out. For example, you know, Rainer getting Sheep Stealer. Um, it, they had like basically what was a five minute sequence all together, but they cut it up and then inserted it at different points throughout different episodes. So instead of just watching it as one sequence, you're like, well, this is happening. This is happening. And I felt like with the Dragon Seeds and definitely with Damon's Visions as well. You know, Millie Alcock's cameo was great the first time she popped up, but then we had her the next episode. And then after that, we had a, a Damon Vision with Viserys. And then after that, it was like, Another one with Paddy Considine, which are all th scenes that I love on their own, but as part of an episode, it's kind of weird watching it. I think, I think Damon's vision should have been two episodes at max, basically. I think, you know, the one with Millie Alcock, you should have had her in the start cameoing. And then at the end of the episode, you end with the vision where Damon beheads her. And that's the last of it. it, it it's weird kind of having two surprise cameos of the same person spread across two episodes. And that's obviously the same with Viserys. Um, and I just felt in terms of structure that everything was kind of laid out in a really, really weird way. I think the dragon seeds could have probably been one episode. Like even when I was reading through the book, I was like, this is a perfect one episode segment, this. And they spread it out over a couple, which was weird. Um, and I think it was just stuff like that, just the way it was laid out. My, my main comment on um, and my main criticism that I kind of went semi-viral for was, how's the dragon 
the House of the Dragon season two finale feels like episode eight in a ten episode season, and I still stand by that. I think just the way they've laid it out is a bit all over the place. Hopefully they sort it out for season three. Um, don't know if they will, but yeah, what a what a wild thing to to wake up to and see um everything just kind of hitting the fan from the creative. Like you never you never hear anyone else basically writing a blog post about why the guys who adapted my work messed it all up and it's gonna suck down the line. So yeah, obviously a lot to unpack there. Um, again, if you're from HBO and you, you're like, can you cut the spoilers out? Just message me and we'll, we'll talk about it. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. A little more relaxed, a little more relaxed video. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. If you want some else to watch, you've also got a House of the Dragon video on screen right now. So definitely head over there right after this. Without the way, I've been your host, Paul. You've been the best and I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.